Well, hello everybody. Welcome. My name is Monty Paulson. I lead the Passive House team at RDH Building Science, and I'm deeply honored to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's Passive House Happy Hour, hosted by Passive House Accelerator. This is an inclusive gathering. We welcome people from all Passive House communities, um, as well as anyone else working to create zero emissions buildings with radically lowered and body carbon. So please turn on your cameras, because we want to see your face. Please turn on your microphones. We want to hear your voice. Please raise a glass or a can or a cup of coffee, depending on where you are, and let's join a toast to Florida and the Magic Kingdom, and we'll all say together, I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> I'm going to Disney World. Going to Disney World. Oh, cheers. Cheers, cheers, everybody. Cheers. So not going. I mean, why not? What could go wrong? Cheers. <laughs> Uh, now, mute your mics. Uh, we have a great, great show this evening. I'm realizing in this instant, Zach, I've forgotten what the uh, what the video is, but we have a great video. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the video is at the Doig River Cultural Center. Right, the Doig River Center. I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing it. And we have a fantastic presentation about monitoring indoor air quality with the reset standard from Enginet Green. And let me turn it over to Prudence. Hi everyone, I'm Prudence Ferreira coming to you from Northern California and missing Vancouver. I lead the Passive House Practice for Morrison Hirschfield and I'm happy to be here with all of you for our 18th birthday. We can vote now. Woo uh, for any newcomers, we welcome you heartily. Uh, this is the group that can make a party out of talking about party walls. I hope everyone is happy and healthy and I'm excited for you all to hear about a program tonight that can help us make passive house environments even healthier. Of course, I have to chime in with my friendly reminder to send us your videos. Hey, whoever, thank you for muting. <laughs> your videos don't need to be fancy, but we definitely wanna see your handiwork. Two to three minutes is the target. And uh, as we mentioned, we have a great video tonight. Uh, we're heading north. Um, it's Eric Olafson's latest project. It's the Doig River Cultural Center. Uh, it was designed by Iredale Architecture and it'll be certified under the FIA standard. Uh, you can go to Eric Olafson's Instagram page for the full length version. But uh, please enjoy this passive house project in cold climate. Greetings, Global Passive House Happy Hour. This is Eric reporting to you out at the Doig River First Nation, which is about an hour outside of Port St. John. And I am gonna give you a quick tour of the Doig River Community Church, Passive House Community Church. The building is about 7,500 square feet. We have a 3,000 square foot daycare on the lower level, 3,000 square foot uh, sanctuary church space on the second level and then there's a mezzanine about 1500 square foot mezzanine at the back it's about a 16 kilowatt uh, PV array we have quadruple pane Zola windows handmade uh, double swing uh, entry doors with panic hardware the designers will be familiar with how difficult that is to uh, source. The next set of stairs takes us up to the mezzanine. A little mechanical closet with the on-demand tankless domestic hot water. And here we have the main sanctuary space. stage, TVs, um, um, control center. Uh, the ceilings, I think, are about 40 feet from the peak to the floor. Um, theater lights, etc. This is the stage. I can walk onto the stage and see the Skylights, very difficult walking up there. And then there is the main sanctuary space. We have 
more clear spruce and it's slightly splayed and it cleverly uh, hides the sprinkler system. Okay, well, that's the church. Um, thanks to Sean St. Amour for the opportunity to give you a little tour and search me out on Twitter and Instagram for other cool mass timber and passive house projects. Bye. Right on. All right. Excellent. So we, uh, that, yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah. So we're going to um, jump into um, small groups, breakout rooms. Um, oh, I need to do my math uh, to figure out. Let's see. Okay. Now I know how many rooms. So I'm going to send you guys to the small uh, breakout rooms for three minutes. So this is a chance to do rapid fire introductions and then we'll move into the meat of the program. See you in a bit. Um, a growing number of health professionals are talking about ventilation. That's good. That's great. Having them talk about ventilation is maybe the, from a building science perspective, the best thing to come out of coronavirus. But unfortunately, they're just saying more. Give us more ventilation. More, 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 more. And ventilation is not like BC bud, where more is always better. Too much ventilation in winter can leave the air very dry, leading to health effects, and too much ventilation in summer can make the air very humid, leading to unhealthy effects. And moreover, just saying you want more ventilation, flow rate alone doesn't tell you what's going on. It tells you nothing of recirculation rate, source control, duct efficiency, or what the outdoor air is happening. Point number three. Those of us in Passive House have been dealing this for more than 20 years. The Passive House standard requires best practices in ventilation exceeding any other code or standard. It's 100% fresh air, 100% of the time, 100% of inhabited spaces. Every single room has a supply and exhaust or is drafted through in some fashion. Some fashion. And recirculation, which is the core question around office spaces and retail spaces, is not allowed in most pass house instances. The flow rate is debated among the project and certifier to make sure you find that Goldilocks spot. The air is filtered both coming and going. Energy recovery is required. Commissioning is re required. The building has to prove that it works to certify. And finally, as if all that weren't enough, within passive house projects, there has to be an operable window in every regular habitable space. This is like the ultimate boost switch, the escape valve. If the well-balanced, well-planned ventilation is not enough, the ability to open the window allows you to adapt. For example, if you have one person who's quarantining and others who are living in the same unit and need to keep some distance, you can open the window and create some additional ventilation that's separate from the nest of the unit. All of which brings us to reset. COVID-19 got us thinking about ventilation. Passive house and other high performance standards can show us a bundle of solutions, but what we really need now is data. We are desperate for data because we have been ignoring this issue for so long. Building operators need data to understand what's happening to make decisions about both operating the buildings they have and ongoing new buildings. And that brings us to Anjanette Green, our next speaker. Ms. Green grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Now, as many of you have noticed, those of us who grew up here come to sustainability from a kind of twisted perspective. We grew up in one of the best wilderness areas left on Earth, so we're rednecks at heart. And we grew up in a region that had very little common with either of the U.S. or Canada, so we're nationalists at heart. And so you'll notice people like Zach and Sean and myself who can't find proper career as well and is up as sort of globe-trotting hillbillies. Well, Miss Green is definitely one of us. In 2012, uh, she moved to Shanghai. She consulted to the first living building projects in China. And living building, much like Passfaus, kind of leads you into other subjects. It led her to indoor air, and she became co-director a uh, co-author and director of standards development for Reset, the first performance-based continuous monitoring certification standard to address indoor air quality. It is my honor to introduce my fellow Northwesterner, uh, Anjanette Green. I don't know what to do now after such an introduction, my goodness. And now that I'm getting jokes about my last name being Green, uh, I have even more pressure on me, but I appreciate that an awful lot. And I think that, um, you know, the more I talk to people who are in this industry, the more I find that they too are either from the Pacific Northwest or right here from Seattle. And I was actually born in Spokane. So um, I have to apologize for those roots to a certain extent, but I guess that's also why I was so prompted to leave. Um, so I guess at this point, without further ado, I it will go into sharing my screen with, um, with all of you. And I'm hoping that it goes without a hitch. These uh, technical sharing incidences can 
either go very well or very poorly. And excuse my thumbnails, I just haven't actually had the time to figure out how to take those off. So you just have to deal with those. Um, but if for those of you who weren't in the session today, I'm going to try really hard um, to kind of explain what Reset does so you, so you know who we are and, and how the standard came to pass. But I don't want to sort of go down into too much repetition. And also for those of you who have sat through my four and a half hours of webinars that are posted on our website, um, you already know a lot of this. So what I'm going to talk about today are a couple of, you know, high-end sort of um, overview and statistics ab about the standard and why I think Passive House and this sort of technical group that you guys have is, is such an amazing fit. So as stated, we are the world's first continuous monitoring performance-driven interior uh, indoor air quality certification program. And to just kind of give you a, a quick timeline and some statistics, we are a very young standard. Um, there's no doubt about it that our team of experts have been in the trenches about air quality since about 2012. Um, but it really by 2017, we started to have these pilot projects. And we only had 43 of them at the time, and it was about 87,000 square meters of total project space. So we call those pilot projects because it was when we were floundering with um, trying to figure out how we were going to standardize this. Um, the technology on the scene was new and quirky and clunky and nobody knew what was what we were going to do. So we really put our heads together and came up with the official standard in 2018. So that is the standard that you find on the website now version 2.0, and we are constantly in peer review groups to improve the standard. So you can always look for amendments and changes, but we will alert you as to when that's going to happen. So fast forward to 2020, we still only have a small number of projects. You know, we're not shattering any records. However, we do have 1.1, almost 1.1 uh, million square meters of project space. So what's been interesting for us to actually see is that it's not the small projects that we're getting, it's the big ones. So large buildings, multi-floors, multi-story towers with huge portfolios of building stock are actually coming to the reset standard. And from what we can gather, it's for two reasons. One is for the first time, the building owner and operator has a chance to actually have something that they're proud about um, and actually certify for a project that is largely based on its core and shell and its HVAC system that's rather new for the industry. And the second is, is that it's performance-based. So it's ongoing, which is very different than putting a plaque on your wall and saying, great, we're, we're, we're amazing, and then you leave for the day. So since January, um, we've got 10 projects in the throes of a pandemic. We're still very pleased to say that we have 10 newly certified reset projects, and we have 11 waiting in the hopper to be audited. We also, in as of February, have 37 new accredited APs. So we've shifted all of our trainings, which have always been person to person, to an online format. So we certainly haven't lost any traction. We have projects in 12 different countries, 51 cities, eight accredited data providers, um, more monitors than we've, we've ever seen, uh, meaning four induct, which were monitors that were never even on the market to begin with, and proud to say that we've got over 500 accredited professionals around the globe. So this line is, everybody loves this line, you can't measure, sorry, you can't ma manage what you can't measure, but I want to add to that, it's really important that you measure in the same way. So what the standard was really trying to focus on was lassoing in this wild, wild west of people who decided that they were going to become experts in air quality and they were throwing around, you know, $20 monitors and thinking that that's going to give them good data. So very apropos to what um, was shown in the video before, um, you know, snapshots of, of t basically tinker toys that you put on the wall is not the way you want to regulate a building. So we really want to be clear that our standard is asking you, what are you monitoring with? Is it accredited? Has somebody looked at its performance? Can somebody attest to its performance? The other is who is actually controlling and aggregating your data? Um, doing it manually sucks. I've tried it. It's not fun. But more importantly, if you're going to have a third party do it, are they secure? Are you sure they're not gamifying your data? Like, do they own the data or do you? And the last is, I think we need to ask the question of how do you report that? What does healthy really mean? It is not our job as a standard to tell a project team what is healthy or not, but we do stand by our thresholds because we look at best practices. 
And so this is why I think a lot of this is not new to this audience. And every time I talk to Passive House, I get a little bit more excited about it because you guys, we don't have to start at zero to have a conversation about ventilation. By design, Passive House is already looking at the performance of the building and a reset standard is gonna come and help you verify that with the data. We're not gonna tell project teams how to design an envelope. We're not gonna tell them all of that, but we're gonna provide the means to actually establish where you place those monitors and how you track that monitoring so you can decouple the building's performance from that of the occupied interior spaces. So it's a really interesting dovetail of the two project um, scopes coming together. Now, I think like everyone, I'm exhausted talking about COVID. I don't wanna make this about COVID, but I do wanna give a nod to the fact that the whole reason why I am in air quality and monitoring is because I have lived half my life in polluted countries. And believe me, when wildfires struck in California and in Washington, on the one hand, I was devastated, but on the other hand, it was ironic because I was, I was actually in Shanghai and we had blue skies and the air quality was stellar. And so it was for the first time, I sort of felt like, okay, I've been banging my head against the wall trying to get people to understand the importance of air quality and they're finally getting it. And if it took wildfires and a pandemic to do it, I guess there is maybe a silver lining that we're gonna finally have an educated conversation about it. And it's important because pollution has been around and it's obviously showing that you're having increased susceptibility with this disease because it's a known fact that if you're exposing yourself to pollutants and it's exacerbating your lung capacity, it's affecting all the organs of your body. So no big surprise there. And I don't want to hammer that too much further, but the reset parameters, the ones that everybody's talking about, humidity, temperature, um, all of those things are part of the reset standard and have been since its inception. We're looking at your measurements for particulate matter, TVOC, carbon dioxide, temperature, and humidity. So while there are some best practices um, that teams are looking at, right now, those are what we require, and here are the performance targets that you're responsible for. Depending on your typology, a commercial interior project has slightly different criteria than a core and shell. And we do have what is called acceptable and high performance. And I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole right now and talk about those, but if you have questions, obviously we can talk about it later, but all of this is downloadable from the Reset website to explain our standards. Um, I also have, hopefully, Beth in the chat box who can field some questions as we go along and maybe link up some uh, information if need be. But again, I'll be sticking around afterwards to answer more questions more uh, fully. So when we're talking about, and I love Monty that you had that image because it strikes a chord with me and it goes to the heart of me because the one thing I want to stress to people is that if you've got a device on the wall that's giving you monitoring and reporting information, that is not necessarily telling you if your building is safe. And it's not so much is it the quality of that monitor, but that monitor might have an algorithm of its own it might have data crunching of its own. And what it's displaying on the screen might not be necessarily data that you need for your building. Maybe that data is showing you 24 seven data and you're actually only interested in occupied hours of your building. So if you come into a building every day and you pass a monitor and it's like, oh my God, we're in the you know, toxic limit, we're gonna fail our certification. It's not the case. If you see spikes on a display on a monitor, they're, they tend to be anomalies. And this is why we're interested in long-term trends over time. We need historical data to make informed decisions. So RESET is asking you for hours of occupancy, monthly data cycles, parameter by, by parameter, daily average package over the totality of your project. So very big picture. Now, for those who wanna geek out over our algorithm, I was prompted to put this in here. It basically shows you how we package that data that's coming from individual monitors for individual parameters. And again, if you wanted to go into this, you can look at that on the website. But the, the takeaway from, from this is that you really need to understand that an audit cycle is one month and it's based on 30 minute packages of data that's coming from those monitors that have to be both meeting thresholds and data quality as in quantity. In other words, you could show that you've got stellar air and your PM 2.5 is on point but you've only got one hour of reporting. The rest of your day, you're missing all that data. Well, clearly we can't certify a project on that. So we have two requirements, both for quantity of data and for quality of data, for lack of a better word, quality meaning your thresholds. 
So I think that's important to stress because a lot of people are wondering, well, how do you certify a project and then uh, it's an ongoing performance issue? Well, we look at it month by month. And once you've attained three consecutive months, you're considered certified, but that certification can also be revoked. You need to maintain that. So our projects are always ebbing and flowing for the duration and lifetime of the building. So Monifer Fit for Purpose is an interesting conversation to just briefly um, elucidate on. There's monitor grades, in other words, the quality of the monitor, its accuracy, but there's also fit for purpose. And it's just a couple of examples. You've got your indoor, which most people are probably familiar with. You've got an induct, um, which is actually extracting from your HVAC duct work. And then you've got your outdoor monitors. And you may or may not be familiar with those, but you can also see those on our website. And I want to quickly talk about a, a, a way to deploy for uh, commercial interiors. There's three criteria that you really need to be looking for if you're going to deploy in an indoor space. You need to make sure that you're covering a percentage of occupants. In the case of full certification, 80% of your occupants have to have some kind of air quality coverage. The second is you need to have a cross section of room types based on their function. And in Reset, we do not, thirdly, permit the a range of monitors to exceed 500 square meters. So this is sort of a visual of an AP putting that together. The colors representing the cross-section of room types. They were nice enough to put the occupant numbers where those are seated. And they actually called out their uh, square meters, so I know that they're not exceeding the range. So this is a really elegant floor plan to show how you're meeting those three criteria. Now, the last couple of slides. I'm going to spend a little time on this. Um, it's a case study, but you have to understand when, you, when we get case studies, they are often um, 12 months after an event because air quality is a contentious topic and a lot of building owners don't want to talk about it. And they're exceedingly private about it because of litigation issues and also they don't want to look bad. So unlike um, certification that awards you for saving energy. You know, you get a applause for that. If you don't meet that, nothing really happens to you. Whereas if it comes to air quality and you say, hey, we've got this great PM 2.5 level now, we've corrected this issue of PM 2.5 and hey, look, our TVOCs are on point. Um, we no longer have this issue of air quality. People are like, what? What was it before? You know, it, you're, it's kind of you're, you're by promoting your good air quality, it's also on the flip side in some cases showing uh, your warts that you had poor air quality. And unless you have the benefit of new construction, um, that, that's often the case. So a lot of our projects are very dicey about sharing their information with us. However, this case study, these are two completely different property owners. Case study one, this is a corn shell building that actually was promoting itself as having the best air quality in this particular city. They promoted the hell out of it. They marketed that they were gonna have this office tower that was gonna be leaps and bounds the best air quality on the planet if you actually come and, and lease space in this yeah. building. So they proceeded with Corin Shell and got their certification. They also ironically had three tenants in the building who uh, successfully got their reset commercial interior certification. So the uh, a day comes where the building operators see an alert that's telling them that there's a problem of VOCs on the 11th floor. So they check out the 11th floor and they come to find that there are people in there during the day unauthorized that are painting. They're doing, they're actually painting the sprinkler heads. And the VOCs from that are actually infiltrating subsequent floors both above and below. So they tell the workers, look, this is unauthorized work. You can't do this. Um, you need to stop. They, they cease doing that. They tell them to leave. And they start a re remediation, clearing the space, ventilation, what needs to be done. Now, at the same time, because there are tenants in the space who are reset commercial interior certified, they too had monitoring. They notice spikes. They're wondering what's happening. And on the way to go to complain to the building operations clue, crew, they're actually intercepted by them. And the crew says, yep, we've been alerted of the problem. Um, it was the 11th floor, uh, the floor right above you. And, you know, we're taking care of the problem. So in the matter, just a matter of, you know, short order, they're able to identify the problem, 
communicate what they're doing to the tenant, allay the fears, and go back on track as these superheroes of a building who are bragging about this amazing air quality. So happy ending, good story. The other building, unfortunately, totally separate owner in a different location, was in the midst of deploying monitors, but got behind schedule and tenants moved in anyways. And at the same time, they're doing renovation and finishing the construction for the podium level. They were doing that work on a weekend and come Monday, they open up the building, the tenants, the small amount of tenants, uh, there's only about 300 people at the time, come into the building to several floors that are occupied, new construction, and they complain because they're having headaches, they're having eye-watering issues. The 300 so mod people walk out of the building and complain to ownership and it creates havoc because the ownership doesn't know where it's coming from. The workers have long gone and so it takes them hours to figure out where the pollutants are coming from. And in that space of time, the people who are already in a city that is culprit for this type of issue, um, it hits a source, a raw nerve with them. And it takes them five days to get the occupants to come back into the building again. So it spoiled trust. And to this day, these clients, the, the tenants in this building still talk about this event. And this is almost 12 months ago. Um, so a lot of trust lost, a lot of time lost, a reputation spoiled. Um, but the happy sort of update to this is that in that case two project, they did indeed complete the installation of the monitors. They have 12 induct monitors and an outdoor monitor. And just in July, it passed its audit phase and was certified. So again, a really nice ending to a story. Um, but they've still had to reinstitute this idea that they're a, ten uh, a building owner that cares for its tenants. So it's part of a building uh, complex. There are six towers, and now all of them are actually pursuing Reset Core and Shell. And when it's completed, they'll have 47 induct monitors and three outdoor monitors for the project. So to kind of talk about you know, the data, what was alerting those operational um, and facilities folks? Like what was actually, what were they looking at? Well, it's based on these data platforms. Again, as a requirement of the standard, you need to have a third party sorry for the airplane, you have to have a third party who's able to take that data, crunch those metrics, and then they can be personalized with alerts. So if you wanna have an alert every time your TVOCs are spiking beyond what is recommended thresholds, you can do so. There's platforms that are designed to do that. Another platform is clear, um, amazing that you can toggle all kinds of parts and features on it. You can download this information, you can display it in a number of ways. So. Again, you know, understanding your data and having a third party and a platform by which you can extract that data, you don't necessarily have to use it for certification purposes, but you can use it for other things. And with that, um, I'll quickly end because I, I don't want to go over too much time and I hope that everybody has some questions for me. <laughs> yes, we do have some questions and I'm really lucky because uh, Beth, has been helping out answer uh, a good portion of them, but I do have a few in the queue here. So Craig, if you want to come on, Craig from Pittsburgh, you had one that I don't believe Beth answered. And uh, again, at the very beginning, um, Beth put in the, uh, the link um, for reset and maybe I'll even just repost it as well. So thanks Beth. And Craig, are you, you ready to go? Yeah, and sure. I see that there's like 40 on some odd chats in there. So I yeah. apologize. Don't worry, don't keep I'm up. Not that's that that's my job. Yeah. <laughs> that's the way we roll, Anjanette. So Good. thanks, Sean. Anjanette, nice job. Thank you very much. I'm excited for having you um, at the Passive House Accelerator because having done a lot of Passive House work over the years, you know, we know that Passive House and Reset Air are just natural. It's just like bread and butter. Um, and there's a reason for that around, you know, we, on the passive house uh, strategy inside of the thing, we believe in tight buildings. I wanted to see if you could talk a bit about how tight buildings, ventilation, filtration, contribute to superior indoor air quality and how reset works hand in hand really nicely with passive house. And maybe if you can touch a little bit on hygienic ventilation and how that is really suitable for a passive house project and it contributes to superior indoor air quality. I mean, by, by name alone, I mean, I think when you're talking about having control, that's your first clue that it's going to be something that's helpful, right? Because if you, 
if you monitor in a space and you can actually get pinpoint control, such as the, the case with the, you know, knowing that it was the 11th floor because they had monitors, actually they had 120 monitors in that building, each positioned at the return. It's brilliant actually how they deployed. They can actually see on such a granular level, you know, what is happening in the space. So there's two things that I love about, you know, this idea of understanding ventilation. If you have an intimate understanding of how your building is conducting itself, is it pulling your ventilation in from where, how, is it recirc, is it not, is it, you know, is it decoupled from where your um, heating and cooling is, if you already know that already, which Passive House by design does, you're already ahead of the curve when it comes to understanding where would you deploy so that you're getting proper data so that you can understand, are you passing thresholds that either the standard sets or that you set? So for me, I think that when you look at where you deploy and how you deploy and getting that ultimate control so that you can have that dexterity no matter what happens is how you arrive at hygienic ventilation. Thank you, Anjanette. All right, and Lois? Um, Anjanette, the question I actually put in the chat, you answered already. It was about builder pushback and legality of like releasing that data and their liability. But I did have a question. Do you know, based on the projects that you are working on right now, are the levels of ventilation that you're seeing that keep these pollutants down, are they higher than our ASHRAE standards? Are they higher than our passive house standards? Do you have any information on that? You know, the one thing that Reset does not currently do is anything having to do with ventilation rates. So while in the future we have discussed it and our peer teams have, we've obviously known that this is probably a condition that we're going to have to think about in the standard. Um, we haven't studied it enough to have an opinion as to what would be good, better, best. However, when it comes to monitors, velocity and that speed is incredibly critical. So yeah. in terms of accuracy for a monitor, um, that's a very different conversation. It's, it's attached to what you're talking about because we're talking about sampling in ducts where the that speed is very different. But as far as speed for, the, for answering your question, it's currently not something that we give practices on or even standards for in, in the reset standard. It's a shame. It would be great to know what the flow rates are. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you this. I had a conversation earlier with Beth, and one of the things that I have been really toying with is I would sort of like to create a reset standard for Passive House or talk about that with my team. Because you guys are so unique, I really feel like it deserves, it, it deserves to have something that is that specific. So I actually would like to open that topic up and because ventilation and those rates are so integral to your standard, I, I think that we'd like to have a conversation and maybe we start it with a, you know, a best practice or a recommendation and we pilot it and we see where it goes. Cause I, I do think that this is a, a good ask and, and honestly, I'd like to actually explore it. We ha we've had organizations like NREL, uh, LBNL, and uh, excuse me, not NREL, LBNL and ASHRAE call us irresponsible as an organization because we're recommending rates lower than they do. And we really don't have anything to fight with. Yeah, well, people are throwing around, keep your building humidity at 80% too, and I have a, <laughs> I have a phone to pick with that, so. Yeah, yeah me too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. You know, I, I wouldn't mind actually for anybody else who might um, have found the building owner pushback and privacy issue. Um, the one thing I can add to that is that there are there is no reason why your project ever has to be public. There's no reason why your data ever has to be public. You can anonymize everything and you can um, apply the standard to the project and and you don't have to actually make any of that known to anyone. So if a building owner wants to actually explore this on their own, that's really up to them. They can use the standard however they wish. However, for an equity um, stance, in order to certify, the data has to be made available to the occupants, not to the world, not to everybody and their dog, but just to the occupants. Great stuff. Uh, Susan and Andrew, I think Beth answered your question. And if, if it's still not clear, uh, message me directly and I'll put you in the queue. Um, but Damien, you're up next. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering uh, your projects that they mainly new builds. So is there any way of getting um, baseline information from old builds 
to actually say that new mm. builds are any better? Oh, such a great question. Um, I don't have, and we don't have enough projects, as you said, from existing. I wish that we did. Um, most of them are new construction, yes. And we do, you know, it's odd. The projects that are, that are actually installing under existing conditions are on the East Coast in the US, which is, I think, a sign of the fact that a lot of these projects that are uh, trying to figure out how they're gonna deal with building reentry and the things to come are trying to are grappling with how we're going to deal with existing real estate. So maybe in a couple couple of months we'll have more data for you. But you're correct in that most of our projects are new construction. We have a lot of different project sizes, but nothing that would actually point to the fact that one is better than the other. I also have to say that it is it is so different from building to building because their HVAC designs are so different. Our buildings in Beijing are couldn't be any more different than the buildings in London. I mean, they're just so vastly different. And whether they're new or old, um, I think that the issue is, is that the, the HVAC designs are just extremely different. Yeah, I, I'm just aware that um, much of the pushback that comes from measuring something is um, not actually knowing what you'd already experienced. <laughs> you know, that, that, that people actually... <laughs> Uh, you know, oh, well, that's a catch twenty two if I ever heard one. <laughs> it is. That's right. This is terrible. Well, in fact, it was no worse on its worst day than what you experienced every day for the last thirty years of your working life. Yeah, I mean, it brings an interesting question, especially when we're looking at outdoor numbers for a lot of regions that don't have an air quality monitor that's near them; it's several miles away. Um, I always find it ironic that the American Lung Association's headquarters is in Chicago and they don't even have an outdoor monitor within a couple of miles of, miles of their office. So, you know, how do you, again, how do you, how do you fix something if you don't know what you're measuring, you have no baseline? Yeah. I think now is a perfect time actually during this pandemic to, to think about how do you actually deploy maybe just in samples um, maybe not a full deployment for, for a full calculation of, of the standard, but maybe start sampling, but use good devices and follow the standard in, in as much of the uh, parts and pieces that you can. I would have imagined that there's a fair number of governments who should be highly motivated that their own employees are actually experiencing good indoor air conditions. Um, but yeah, it's still maybe early in the piece. Yeah, it, you know, most of our um, it, we <laughs> embassies across the globe tend to love our standard. So we have, if you look on the Reset website, um, I think we've sent you a link. If you look at projects under the Reset website, um, you'll see a lot of embassies and consulates. And we, we just spoke to one here in our own country who is actually going to be deploying um, for those very reasons. We are also in partnership with the World Green Building Council who have deployed across the globe to um, areas in the world that have a very hard time getting their hands on monitors. So with some sponsorship, yeah. we've been uh, delivering a hundred some odd monitors across the globe to regions that otherwise could never actually monitor their air. Cool. That's a Thanks. good segue. Thanks, Damien. Uh, good segue for Susan to ask your question. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Anjana. Really interesting. Um, I was noticing um, when I just sort of glanced quickly at your website, the Reset website, um, some of the terminology, for example, corn shell, commercial interiors, they, they kind of echo the LEED standards or the LEED certification. Um, and I'm, I'm certain, I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of intentional, but I'm also thinking in terms of uh, LEED existing buildings, operations and maintenance or corn shell, there are credits in there that require uh, not require, but you have the choice of putting in instrumentation. And I'm just wondering how much are the, is the reset aligned with the lead? Yeah, that's such a great question. I actually, um, we do a lot of work with the team over at lead and the nomenclature, you know, again, I, we wanted to make sure that it was easily understood whether the precedent was one that we enjoyed using that nomenclature or not, it is what it is. So commercial interiors, corn shell and residential, I think it's the nomenclature people can understand. So 
why, why change it midstream? Um, that aligns a little bit with well and LBC. So we have crosswalks with all of those, and there's a difference between a, an equivalency, a crosswalk, and an alternative pathway. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, if you, I can send you all those links <laughs> to all of that because it is a Bible of stuff to read. But with all of those, the one thing that those certifications don't have is they don't have as robust of requirements and they certainly don't have things about continuous monitoring. So you're on point with your USDBC lead O&M. So for that particular one, what you do is you've got those five points and you have to amass a 40 uh, total score. And one mm -hmm. of them is uh, the, uh, I've forgotten what it's called. Building performance. Measurement. Yeah. yeah. And under that is the air quality performance. Yes, you are allowed to use continuous monitoring for that. So you can use the reset standard. You can use continuous monitoring. You're welcome to, you know, talk to Chris or to one of those folks over there um, who's charging up ARC because that data would go into the ARC format that, along with your um, occupant survey. And that's mm -hmm. how you would total your points. Mm -hmm. So okay. I can send you that if you would like. We're also in conversation with them to try to get us into um, getting credits under new construction because we've just been talking about that for a really long time and it's overdue. But for mm -hmm. the run well projects, um, fit well. Uh, we're also part of Gresby, recognized by Gresby. Um, there's a myriad certification. So if that's of interest, I can I can yeah. send. Those. Well, I was just interested because I know lead more intimately than fit well or the well, but I mean, they're, they're all have similarities, but I was just wondering in terms of, you know, getting a credit, getting a point. Yeah. Um, so you're saying you're ha trying to have a conversation about that sort of. No, morphing. currently you can. Yes, oh, you, you can. can. What I'm trying to get them to do is for a new construction. <laughs> That's oh. the one I want. <laughs> okay. Because currently okay. their air quality credits under new construction are, are almost unattainable. Um, but that's another conversation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for O and M. So if you're trying to do recertification, or mm -hmm. if you're trying to do O and M, that's where you can use the reset standard that would apply for for either of those because it's the same. It's the same guide. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Angela. I so, think I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was on mute. I got too much going on here. Um, Daniel, there you go. You're ready. Thanks. Hi, Angela. Hello. Uh, question about how how to get these systems in design so um, <clears throat> do, do uh, does a mechanical engineer specify the equipment a contractor install it and then somebody else come and help you with software or is there kind of a one-stop shop you can go to somebody and they'll pro provide the equipment install it themselves and set you up okay that's a great so question and it depends on where it depends on it, where in the world you are <laughs> yeah I, I guess I ask because I'm in New York City I want to do this in our own office. I called some of the companies who provide the monitors that are on the reset website and it was kind of a dead end. I, I couldn't figure out how to get it done. Yeah. And you're not alone in that. And again, being such a, a young nascent certification, the parts and pieces are also young and nascent and it is an imperfect process. However, we have two teams uh, that could help you in in the east tbl is one of them and tribute tribute is actually based in shanghai but his specialty is dealing with the shipping of products and helping with teams um, with everything involved with communications because i realized the monitors that we have some of them are from india the lion's share are from china and that's just because of where they're manufactured there are a few that are um, u.s owned but they're manufactured also in china um, probably no surprise to anyone here. But of those two groups, I'm more than happy to make an introduction because they can take off a little bit of the pain of you know, trying to get cut sheets, trying to get some pricing, understanding the criteria, what are the difference between the monitors, um, and they can help you with package delivery as well, depending on quantities. The piece that you're asking about as far as who can come in and deploy we have teams that are more established because they're, they're far more mature in places like uh, Beijing and China. The US does not quite have that. So I think Beth might actually also be a good person and Craig to chime in on this because they've had experience and they understand what it takes to actually uh, create a specification and the scope of work for which teams handle what. Because you do need to consider a couple things. You've got to consider electrical and data 
that you have to pull. And of course, you know, just the, the basic aesthetics and drywall and all of those things that are coupled with any kind of construction like this. So I don't have teams in the states and I don't necessarily have a cookie cutter profile of how you would actually um, price this out and engage those teams and write their scope of work. But typically in your electrical um, or your emergency um, signaling plan, people who are doing uh, sprinklers or CO monitoring. Great, and now we're off to uh, Berthold who had a, a question more, I think in line with one of the slides, um, but I think he just wants some clarification, but it should be a good one. Yeah, um, Lois already asked about the airflow, airflow rates. And I just wanted to ask, was there a ventilation system running in these two buildings, in these two examples, what you have shown? As if yeah. there would be a mechanical ventilation, the, the, uh, the problem should have been disappeared within hours or maybe half a day. And so it, it should have been ventilated. Yeah, and you know what? They even when they were painting in the space, in case in the first case where they're painting the sprinkler heads, they actually even had covered up the return ducts, and still they were getting infiltration. They were having so. Okay. You know, and I had this conversation. I asked the same question, and I was like, "But you know, if there were a fire, and they would have had smoke in through the whole building, that's completely against code. Like, who designed this place?" And he said, you know, be that as it may, uh, it was still reaching into parts of the building where it shouldn't have been. Now, was that it, it pointed to a much bigger problem then, right? It wasn't just an issue of, oh, we've got TVOCs because you're doing work in this space and you're, you know, doing it incorrectly. Now it points to a larger question. The ventilation system is <laughs> maybe it's not designed correctly at all. Or maybe we have so much leakage and infiltration from the elevator shafts and we just don't have the proper design. So it pointed to a lot of bigger questions. Um, but yes, the ventilation system was running. However, both of the buildings, neither were fully occupied. And if you know anything what it's like in China, the tenants move in literally on top of the construction still being active. So it really doesn't come as much surprise to me that there was probably a heavy dose of construction going on in on that weekend to actually merit that much infiltration. Yeah. Well, and uh, this emphasizes what Lois uh, uh, asked before. We should, in parallel to your monitoring, you should know about airflow. So it's it should go in parallel. No? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, I was bombarding you about this question, but a uh, few people have asked it. So, Tim, fire away. Oh, I guess Scott's going to have to ask it. I think he may have distracted, gotten distracted. Yeah, that's it. Scott, you might as well ask it because uh, Tim's doing something. Oh, you guys. <laughs> I'll have to ask it for you. They, were, of course, wanted to know what is the cost of, the, of, of setting up a system like this. Yeah. Okay, so obviously a big loaded question, and I'm gonna do my best to answer it in the way that I can, because there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. Okay, the first thing are hard costs. If you wanna know what the hard cost of the monitor is, you can easily find out. It will, of course, depend on your quantities. So if you have, you know, 100 and some odd monitors, your pricing will likely be lower if you're just trying to buy one. Um, however, the range of monitors for an interior monitor ranges everywhere from 200 to almost 2000. And I want to sort of couch this by making everybody understand that it's kind of like the difference between buying a, um, you know, a, oh, I hate to, I hate to do this, but I, I, don't, I don't know about another analogy. Like if you're trying to buy, a, you know, an old PC or the, the brand new MacBook Air, okay, you're paying for the R&D, the design, the marketing, the savvy, but if it's past a reset accreditation process, the sensors are still meeting our criteria. So 200 to 2000 for the range, just for the monitors. You can actually have an AP help you with deployment and you can get a figure of how many. So that's simple math. The other part of that is the hard cost for the certification, which is on the website. And our standard is extraordinarily low priced. So if you, depending on your currency or your country, you can put that in. If you know the square meters or square feet of your project, you punch that in and it spits out the data, the cost of your particular project. The last piece is the most complicated one, which is who is going to put all this together and who's going to come and do the construction and put them in place. So that's the part that tends to be very different. When I priced out a project that was in San Francisco using union workers over the weekend, um, using over overtime hours, it was extraordinarily high, but it would have been so no matter what you were doing. 
Whereas if you're trying to do a residential project and you have a close relationship with your contractor, um, maybe he can fold that into some other part of his scope, but he also might shy away because it's something new. So you need to make sure that you're asking trades that are sort of familiar with this type of installation so that you're getting numbers and things they're not padding on there just simply because they have a lot of unknowns. The last piece is your data provider. So a data provider is basically a software. Usually it's about 180 to 200 and something per monitor. And these data providers have their own pricing. There are, you know, we don't actually control uh, the, the data providers, um, but it's a service they provide. And it's usually about 100 and some odd bucks uh, per monitor. And so you can round that out and get some pricing you know, it's fairly accurate and padded a little bit with maybe attic stock or whatever else you need to do to, to couch yourself against um, the timeline of the project and inflation and such. Um, great. And uh, Craig was very helpful to put on the uh, uh, air fee calculator. So great stuff. You had a lot of support in the questions that have helped me. As I well. knew so, I would. <laughs> hey, it takes a team to keep this thing going, I tell you. Um, now let's turn it over to Zach to wrap up the happy hour. Great. Thank you, Anjanette. This is really fantastic. And I want to share what's coming up next week. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation. Uh, it's going to be um, with Wei Kuang of the Passive House Institute. And he's going to be sharing China, uh, projects from China, specifically three big residential developments, two kindergartens, and one vernacular building uh, renovation. I think I've seen photos of, the, of that last one, and it's very striking. And um, so anyway, we're, we're in for a treat next week. And uh, Monty, why don't you take it away? Well, what a great discussion. Thanks everybody. Special thanks to Eric Olofsson. I love that church project. I can't believe I forgot that was tonight's video. It's actually one of the most beautiful projects I think in a province of British Columbia where an awful lot of beautiful work is happening. Special thanks to Anne Jeanette. I know this was a lot to pull together. I'm really grateful for your sharing and I certainly would love to join in conversations about seeing if we can create some sort of a alliance between some past house projects and reset. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Once again, it's halfway through July. We're halfway through 2020. That alone should be worth a beer. Um, you're free to go now, but if you want to stick around for the after hour, that'll be starting right away. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Uh, special thanks to Beth and Craig for answering questions in the chat as we were going along. Really exciting to hear about the reset standard and I'm, I'm definitely excited about the, uh, the partnership that can exist between Passive House and Reset. Thanks so much.